All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka, and we have an incredible guest for you today. We have Rosemary Ravenel with RMR, RMR Communications, and, and I need some of the help we're going to be talking about, critical speaking skills for leaders. Rosemary, welcome. Thank you, Damon. So excited to be here. Yes. Well, I just want to say, and we were talking about this before, uh, before we got on live. It's I, I'm I'm just honored to have you here today, Rosemary. Uh, your your background and and the things that you've done is just going to be so much fun talking today, and just happy that you're here today. Honored. I'm honored because I know you have a big following, and I've been watching this uh, this this podcast and your LinkedIn lives, and I know that uh, your content is always relevant. We, we like to have fun and we like to share interesting people's knowledge. It's, it's really cool. And today talking with you about critical speaking skills for leaders, I think is, is a fitting topic for, for the audience that we normally speak with because in business, people are always trying to figure out how do I communicate better? How do I really get my message across? And we're going to talk about that, but we always like to talk, like to start by talking about your background. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about your background a little bit and what really brought you to where you are today and helping people improve their speaking skills. It's been a long journey here. Several decades, I won't say exactly how many. More than th more than 3 decades. The path I took was look, I wanted to be a broadcast journalist when I was in college. But I had a stammer, so I wasn't all that confident speaking live or speaking in front of an audience. I'll get back to that in a moment. So I discovered writing. I discovered journalism in high school and in college. I was editor of the, of the newspapers for both high school and college and mm -hmm. developed a, a, a love of, of, of communications. I graduated with a degree in broadcast journalism, but I took an easy way into business through public relations, which was a sexier, paid better. You know, I, this is the, the time when you leave home and you want to have my, I wanted to have my own apartment in Manhattan, New York City, you know, big time, independence and such. So I went that route and I stayed pretty much in the public relations, corporate communications world for quite some time. And with, with some detours into, into media, but I wasn't really ready to do that because I still had this speech impediment and I was able to work through it, as a matter of fact, through broadcasting. Because when I started doing radio in college, I realized that when that microphone is hot and I'm speaking into it, there's no room for error. It was like, you know, the, the deer in the headlights thing. Okay, you're on. That's it. You got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. And there's, and, and I remember the first time I did it. And when I was able to speak fluently and fluidly, I was like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. But then I went back to my old patterns when I was not on air, but it showed me that, that I could, that maybe there was just a little switch in my head that I needed to, to, to flip, to be able to summon the clarity that I needed in order to do broadcasting. Oh. And a lot of it, and a lot of it came also with a voice coach who helped me understand how to take pauses, how to take a breath into a difficult word, and how to break up sentences into shorter phrases that would allow me to then get ready for that next set of sounds and to do them without stumbling. Wow. And, and after that, I went into, I had the privilege to work for companies like Avon, which is now Natura, uh, AT&T, um, A&E History Channel, NBC Universal Telemundo, uh, and leading into my most recent corporate job, which was head of public relations, VP public relations for Univision Network, which is the Spanish mm -hmm. language media company. So I stepped out of that to do what I'm doing now because I've always loved to do coaching of executives. Uh, I had an opportunity to do live television uh, network at the, in the early, early stages of MSNBC, 
when there were contributors around a table and we would gather to just talk about the news of the day with no prompting, no script, no advance notice. And we would just, you know, chatter away about, you know, what do you think, Rosemary? What do you think, Damon? And it was great training. It was uh, yeah. to sp- impromptu speaking on steroids. Mm-hmm. And I love that so much. I went on to do some local local television, uh, public affairs programs in New York, and then worked a great deal as a as a spokesperson for many companies where I was the really the the corporate representative, you know, with the media. And looking back at my career, you know, I've always enjoyed getting myself ready and getting other people ready to speak with confidence and clarity and with influence. You know, because sometimes people you hear people talking and they're they're saying making sounds, but they're not really bringing anything of value. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's. I'm just thinking through some of your some of your career as being a spokesperson for for companies. I bet that there were some some really fun times when you were a spokesperson and then there probably were some difficult times when you're a spokesperson mm-hmm. so do any do any of these great or challenging times stick out in your mind over the over the years where you had to get up in front of the microphone and and it was like this is so cool we just you know landed on the moon kind of thing or we just you know had had something that wasn't great happening you know damon it's 50 50. Most mm-hmm. of the time, I would need to speak uh, the script of the employer. So it was yeah. already it was already written for me, or I had yes. or, or I had had a hand in shaping it, and mm-hmm. that wasn't very gratifying because I sometimes didn't believe a hundred percent in what I was being asked to talk about. Yes, and those are times when you sort of keep your not so much your ethics, but your you compromise your integrity just a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. Mind you, I never worked for a company whose values I didn't support in some way. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so that that's where I drew the line. But sometimes I didn't necessarily agree, or if I was asked to say that, you know, this, uh, for example, I worked for uh, for Ericsson for Sony Ericsson in the early days of mobile telephony, and sometimes you know, I was a Hess, for example. One thing comes to mind. When we were, this sounds like the dark ages, it wasn't that long ago, it was 20 years ago, mm-hmm. that we were launching a waterproof, water resistance, uh, impact resistant phone that was meant for the the construction trades, you know, for workmen, for work people, right? That would be rugged enough to get wet, wet would be, you know, drop on a brick. Mm-hmm. And, and I did a media tour about you know, showing how this phone was. It was big and it was orange. It was like this big, you know, it was like, yeah. Big. And it was so rugged, you could drop it into a bowl of water and it would still work. <laughs> well, sometimes the the test didn't quite pan out because oh, it didn't work when you took it out of the water and tried to make a call. And it was funny because it, it I believed in the product. I knew the technology was a little bit, early yes. and now of course we laugh at that because you know it said that the 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 mobile phone world has skyrocketed into, into the yeah. the galaxies yes. uh, but uh, but the um but those days were there was still a lot of skepticism you know and we were making bold claims about the product being waterproof i mean it it, it went on to launch into market it wasn't a huge resounding success because shortly after, of course, as soon as soon as Apple got into the picture, I mean, it was just it was a whole, totally different a ball game, right? There are some companies that didn't survive, including Ericsson in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, just too much competition. But in any case, that was one of those moments where you say, okay, let's put this in the glass of water and or the bowl of of, of water, and and then you take it out and it doesn't work. But most of the time, uh, it was sometimes making claims and being very sort of hyperbolic about this being the best and the only and the you know the, the 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 total solution to something when there was still you know a little bit of of margin that maybe it didn't work as well or maybe there were others that were equally yeah. good and so there was a, a a little bit of discomfort for me uh but there were other times like working for history channel for example 
the the programming is so rich and so valuable and so uh you know uh, uplifting mm-hmm. that yes. there was always so much so much unknown history and personalities and places and moments in time that were just really energizing to you know to talk about so it was uh, it was a mix of things and i think that's just consistent i mean i think we're i was fortunate to be able to work for companies whose whose messages and and uh, whose principles i really value and and respect but there are times of people in my industry we don't always get that chance yes yes i bet yeah yeah i'm sure um because the amount of of sales language that goes into these the the promotional and this this spokespeople have to have to uh have to convey it, it it varies greatly from company to company but you did bring up something about the history channel and discovery and and, and a and e when you were working there what really what really did you like the best about that kind of environment where you're really i mean that's that to me is just an educational thing and a dis, as the as the channel says discovery did you did you really take to that because of that kind of environment or oh yes 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 the 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 nonfiction part of it you know we we're talking about mm-hmm. about uh, events about science about nature and yeah, things yeah. that bring really enrich our lives it's it's entertainment is infotainment to some extent but it is uh, it, it gives people something that they didn't have before. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to just just sort of keeping us entertained and busy, our brains busy for a period of time. It actually leaves you with something. That's that a good point. Can, and that and that that to me is is uh, is television or media worth consuming. Yeah, that is true because it is it does leave you with with uh, a little bit of value after the after it's over. So as as uh, when you were at Univision, what were you doing at Univision? Because I mean, in it's just Univision is such a huge, huge business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What what was interesting there for you? Oh, it, it was always fascinating. It, it the business is fascinating. It yeah. is the largest uh, uh, Spanish language entertainment company uh, in the world right now. Uh, with its acquisition mm-hmm. of, uh, of Televisa, uh, the, the Mexican giant of content. And the, there was always something interesting to discover, to, to talk about, to write about, to publicize. Uh, there are you know, tons of programming that are unique and distinctive. There, is, there are so many different personalities and on-air talent you know, who each have their own quirky... Yes you know, demands and understanding them and, and helping them be more successful. Uh, it's conveying the, uh, the, the performance of the, of a network compared to their competition. Uh, there's uh, it really, it's a whole world of, of, of interesting people and content and uh, challenges every day. Uh, mm-hmm. So I was, I was in charge of public relations for the entertainment division. So basically yeah. what you saw on air, except for news, that's that, that was a different division. Wow. That's, that's something cool. So as we move forward into today, I mean, you, you enjoyed the news. You enjoyed being a spokesperson. What really flipped the switch or, or how did you kind of come into, I want to help individuals be better communicators, better speakers. Because I, I'm an observer of, of these kinds of things. I listen carefully. I watch, I, I'm a visual learner. And so I watch and I hear people saying dumb things. And I'm saying to myself, why couldn't that have been said differently? And I understand from not only practice and working in the business that what you say matters, how you say it matters. People form opinions about you about me about anyone based on the first seven seconds of contact with you and it's not only what you say and how you say it it's all of you your presence it's the it's the visual uh, of the appearance the demeanor the energy and all these things no one really teaches us now if you're if you are an actor and you've done stage work and of course that's something that, that comes with your craft but in, in the business world, we typically don't learn these things. 
maybe we've been part of a debate team and we learned some speaking skills there, but I'm talking about the, the day-to-day communication in the workplace, mm-hmm. the kind of communication that, 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 that builds trust, that, that, that galvanizes teams, that inspires followers, that convinces investors, right? That keeps employees happy and, and, and valued and feeling valued and respected and, um, and, and connected. And you know, community, having a clear purpose of how you serve a community. All these things are really best transmitted through the human voice. You can write about it all day long, but it's when someone gets up to actually talk to you about that and looks you in the eye, whether it be the virtual eye or the, or the in-person eye, that's when it really hits the nerve of, of, of comprehension. It's the empathetic way of communicating to the brain, you know, through the heart. So the heart is really the best way to get to the brain. And that's been proven through neuroscience. So if you impact someone with honesty, with authenticity, with your personality, and you don't have to be the most eloquent, articulate, uh, well-spoken person, I mean, that helps. But it's it's the it's the quality of your ideas, and the uh, the emotion and the sincerity that you bring to the communication, and the clarity of message. That's something that has to be consistent. The clarity of message and the intention that you are applying to what you're communicating. Yeah, clarity of message. Yeah, that is something. Well, and and I, I really, I really love to hear you say that you don't have to be the most eloquent speaker because that's me but uh, but you know i i think Mm -hmm. too you said a couple things um brevity in and and don't say dumb well this is what i took of it if you can reduce the amount of dumb things you say along the way it will definitely help uh and and i think we when i listen to people talk or listen to myself doing a little bit of video, you kind of get to, you you think about this and you see yourself talking, you realize that we fill in gaps. We say things when we don't, when a lot of time spent thinking maybe really what we want to be doing or we should be doing. So what, I mean, when you're talking to people one-on-one, what are some of the common things that you see that, that you go across the board? This is one of the things I see commonly that people can can usually we should start working on i thought you were well i think you're baiting me into talking about filler words i'm going to go there in in i wasn't but that's good okay (laughs) are you are you asking one on one on one is is as important as one to a thousand in Mm -hmm. a way it's it's even more important because you have an intimacy that happens there's a, there's a proximity that exists that you don't have when you're on a stage addressing a large audience or you're on uh, a video call. However, let me, let me condition what I just said. On video, it's much more immersive because you and I know that people watching right now or watching on replay will be able to do full screen, okay, look for you know a pimple on my nose, or mm-hmm. kale in my teeth, you know, looking because we we're seeing each other in an immersive manner that's not possible in person. You're not going to get right up to someone's face when you're in person. That's a breach of etiquette and that's invading someone's personal space. But on video, we can do that with sort of incognito. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we have to be ready to be seen in all these different ways. So the one-on-one is is important to, uh, to, to, to use that. I mean, obviously we need these skills, Damon, whether we're doing it for, for work, you know, for, uh, for home, for our family, whether we're speaking to our children, to our parents, to our neighbors, to our uh, church members, you know, to the you know, PTA, to, or we're running for elected office. All these mm-hmm. things are, 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 have to be consistent presentations of who we are, sort of like you're safeguarding your personal brand. And the personal brand is sometimes, we know, really put to the test when people don't care for how they are showing up on social, what they post, how they post, 
how they show up in a photograph. I mean, you really need to curate yourself very, very carefully and be very watchful for how you're coming across. Because today, everything speaks to who we are. But let me go back to filler words and what, uh, what you could also consider lazy speech, words that are unnecessary because we're now becoming so accustomed. And let me tell you this, put on cable news, put on cable news and you will hear someone or many people answering questions. I mean, you know, Damon, it's like, you know, Damon, I'm glad you asked that question. It's like, I mean, absolutely. It's that, what, what, what have I said? I've said nothing. I've said, it's a good question, but a good question is almost a way of buying a few seconds to think about what you want to answer. But it's constant. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, um, ah. I mean, it's, it's, it's now become almost normalized. And that's awful because every, every sound you utter that's not giving any value or conveying any, any information, it's like just clutter. It's like static, you know, on a, on a, on a recording. It's, it's unnecessary noise. And ultimately what happens is that people perceive us as unprepared, uninformed, nervous, tentative, possibly even insincere. She's hedging. She doesn't want to answer the question. So she's saying, you know, I mean, it's like, okay. And that is just, we've become lazy about it. Maybe many of the people who are doing it today, who are nationally recognized experts may not realize they're doing it, but because it's done so much, it becomes normalized. Wow. There's a lot of good stuff in there. I just want to say that because you, you, you talked about the unnecessary noise and, and the fact that this is getting normalized. So let's, let's back up a little bit. Cause I am in it. It probably is not evident in, in, in my speaking, but the ums and the uhs and those kind of things I really have over the last few years worked to get that out of my vocabulary. And I notice a difference in myself. And I think you bring up a, a big point as people listen to those people speaking that are doing that it does make it hard to focus on the topic at hand sometimes almost and it's it's just it's challenging the the other thing i was going to ask you in those situations where where you're getting rapid fire questions back and forth because this situation that i'm in and i know other leaders are in often uh is that when i'm being asked questions is it better for me just to pause and take a moment to think about it and then respond? Because I know a lot of people just want to say something. The pause is a, a moment of grace. It is a moment that just on its own commands attention. Because when you stop speaking... people will look up and see what happened. Is she getting ready for a big statement? Or here's another one. When you take a breath, like, it's like, I'm getting ready to say something big because I'm taking a breath and I'm re getting ready to belt it out. It also brings people to you. It's like a magnet to you. Mm -hmm. The pause is, is just a magnificent device. You can use it in so many ways, certainly to give you time to think, but it's also divides, consider it a divider, almost like a, a section break that also can give you time to pivot to a different topic if you want to change the topic or, or, or sort of divert back to your main point if you think the conversation is going a little bit off the rails. It is, it's also a wonderful way to diffuse heated conversations. When people are angry, when I'm angry, I'll just start chattering away because it's this reaction, this emotional, like, 
oh, I'm angry. And da, 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 da. If you take that breath and step back and say, this is really that important. If I've been physically, you know, injured, is this, you know, for example, it, traffic, someone cuts you off in traffic and you want to just belt out some curse word, take a moment and take a deep breath. And then you'll realize, hey, it's nothing. Nothing happened. Just a bad driver. Mm-hmm. And you move on and you, you gain a little bit of perspective. Well, similarly, it's much easier to take those pauses, be more thoughtful about what you say than having to go back and clean it up. And don't we see every day in the media people making public statements that they have to walk back because they said it without thinking. And some of these people are very intelligent, educated people, yet they still fall into that trap. Literally, almost like you said, everyone that's in the public eye has done that. Yes, hmm. and you know how much people struggle then to walk it back. You can't, you can't make it go away. You said mm-hmm. it, and in most cases, it's been recorded somewhere by someone. So you yeah. can't deny that, that you said it. You just have to be, again, more thoughtful about saying it correctly the first time. It's like a retraction in a newspaper. Nobody reads that. They just read the main story that hit the front page. The retraction's on the third page or the fifth page or the 10th page. Yes. Nobody reads yeah. that. And, and and it happens and it happens. And yeah. and it's human, you know, human foibles, it, it happens. But it's when you see it happen with such regularity. It's just one after the other, after the other, after the other. You say, hey, is this now become the standard of the way people miscommunicate? And that's that to me is uh, is is a little bit dangerous because we're at a time when we need to understand each other. We need to have bridges of understanding. We need to really have those quality conversations and not leave anything to chance. Amen to that. So when you're helping people in in these leaders and you're helping them speak. And they're preparing. Do you often have to teach them how to take what they want to say and make sure that they're not getting too technical, too businessy, mm-hmm. too whatever? And and walk through that process a little bit of what you really need to do there. Because I know it's a if if you're in business and, and you're leading, that inevitably has to affect you. It's important for people to understand that you have to first and foremost know to whom you're speaking. So your message for one audience will be different than it will be for another audience. So that's where you start. You know, who who are you talking to? Who is going to be listening or watching or in that room? And what do they need from you? What are you providing that only you can provide? information, guidance, motivation, or whatever it is that they need. Or maybe you're trying to influence them to sell or to buy, I mean, to, 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 to buy into what you're selling or to invest in your business. Who are they and what do they need to hear in order to be persuaded? That's where it starts. So in some cases, maybe it is technical jargon. If you're speaking, if you're an engineer and you're talking to a room of engineers, you can want, well, you want to speak the engineering language. But if you're talking to a group of, of let's say, uh, a graduating class at a, at, a, at a college or a commencement address or you know, to a group of, um, I don't know, a group of uh, concerned citizens about something, you want to speak their language. You want to be simple, understandable, no acronyms, no jargon. And be sure that they will understand you. So it really, it varies so much based on who your audience is. So that that's really where it starts. And very often when I work with someone one-on-one, like say it's a CEO, they are, they've been given a speech written by someone else where they really haven't had the time to, to massage it, you know, to, to wordsmith it. And so they're reading just for the sake of, um, of uh, economy of, of, of time and resources. Someone very well-intentioned, well-informed about the business is writing something, 
that may be taken literally, and that's really not the best approach. So you have to not only know to whom is being addressed, but you have to understand, you have to be comfortable with your words, with the way you say things. So let's say that, for example, you're, you're not a native English speaker. And say that in my case, I work a lot with Spanish English speakers, bilingual speakers. And that person has a difficulty with a word like successfully. It's a difficult word to say even in English. So why would you use the word successfully when you can use a lot of different uh, synonyms or other words to say the same thing? Mm -hmm. Right. You could say achieve the goal or have, you know, have have be, be the winner you know, there's different ways of saying the same thing, but to be stuck on successfully when it doesn't come naturally to your tongue is just giving you what I, what I call the stutter, <laughs> the stutter in your script that doesn't have to be there. So I work, I massage and polish those scripts, work it into that person's cadence. So let's say the person prefers, does better with short sentences and likes to have a lot of eye contact and 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 get acknowledgement from the from the audience you know it's very very warm and engaging but you want to have that person have shorter sentences and maybe maybe have some moments where you can ask for feedback from the audience how many of you have have seen that or experienced that and you see a show of hands so that you have a much more conversational approach to something other people like to be up on a stage and just deliver their their speech because maybe they're being live stream to 10 countries or more and they're talking to a big 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 audience hybrid so there really isn't that much opportunity to have that warm touch touch with anyone so you have to be much more one way you know just be uh the information supplier of sorts but still you have to speak more slowly take into consideration people in other countries need to understand what you're talking about not use a lot of you know, big words. So there's, that's what I love is seeing the, the scenario and the end goal. Also, what do you want to achieve? Because mm -hmm. everything has to have an end, end goal. What is it? What's the, you know, what's the, what's behind me? What's at the end line? You know, the goal line, what, what is it that you want to achieve and what do you want people to remember and take with them? Because likely they're only going to take away at most three ideas. You know, there's that beautiful, uh, sacred number three, which is the trio, you know, the triplets, the triumvirate of ideas where we are, our, psych, our psyche is geared to remember things in groups of three. You know, hence you'll find uh, why, why do we have, you know, the three stooges or the, the three little pigs we could have five little pigs, you know, we can, <laughs> but, but it doesn't quite sound right, quite right. Right. It's, it's the, the threes, the three number is a number that has in nature and in physics, just a lot of qualities that just, just belong. It's, it's just a, an order, a divine order to things. So when we, we think about give people three things to take away and you can actually, you can enumerate them as you're talking, you can enumerate them at the top of your speech throughout and then at the end, you can summarize beautifully by saying, you know, the three things I want you to remember are, and, and then you have a nice structure, a bookend of, of, of these three main ideas that just help you organize and then help your audience organize their memory. Yeah. Wow. I love listening to how you dissect how someone can speak and and provide more impact and create the results that they they want to achieve with their communication it's incredible listening to you it really is and i know just from listening to this last segment here when you're talking about it you know know to whom you're speaking to what do they need from you what do they need to hear and then keep it into the three basic ideas is so critical and informational because i think about times when when you're speaking or i've heard other people speak how that would have helped so my next question is what do people do because i i've got to imagine there's quite a transformation when you work with somebody on this 
what are some of the things that you've heard before and after they've, they've talked about after they've worked with you a while? The transformation happens when that speaker delivers the speech presentation in whatever setting it is, and then comes back to say, I felt so much more confident. I enjoyed it. I didn't fear it. I wasn't trembling in my shoes. I actually was in the moment. I was connected to my audience. I had fun. I had fun as opposed to the dread of, oh God, I can't wait for this to be over. Oh my God, <clears throat> what time is it? Oh God, oh, seven o'clock, I'll be done with this. Oh no, enjoy it. Enjoy it because that's where people pick up on that. Mm -hmm. People pick up on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. People, people, uh, whether they, you, you, know, you, you can tell them, hey, I'm having such a good time. Or you can show it in your body language, in your smiling, in your tone of voice, right? It, and it becomes really, people pick it up. It, you don't have to say it. And then when you get off the stage and you say, hey, I was nervous because nerves never really go away. Let me tell you that. Anybody who says that they are not nervous is a liar because everybody gets nervous. They just know how to deal with it. They just know how to deal with it, yes. work through it. Just like I learned to work work through the stammer, everybody everybody does because it's that moment of that anticipation, right? And you want to do your best, and probably maybe your feet are a little wobbly, or maybe there's what I call the butterflies are in your stomach, and your stomach is rumbling, and your mouth gets dry, palms might get a little sweaty, but you know that that's going to happen, and you just you know deal with it, and you know uh, you sort of uh, march through it. And, and do what you have to do. But if you enjoy it, if you, here's, here's really a, a real secret. If you think of yourself as providing a service to the people you are talking to and you're adding value and you're giving them something they didn't have before, the, the equation gets flipped so that it's not about you. You're not doing Hamlet on a stage. You are delivering something of value to the people, not that to say that the actor isn't delivering value, but you're not reading a script, you're not memorizing or delivering an actor's portion of, of, a, of, of a play. You are bringing something of, of you to the audience. So you're giving them a gift. And so I tell my, my, my coaches, think about you giving them a gift, a gift of insight, knowledge, perspective, whatever you, whatever it is that you're delivering, because then the focus isn't on you. It's on them. And it makes a world of difference, Damon. It really does. Wow. That's, that's so cool. Because when you do that, just like you said, the focus is on them, not on you, but how that, the, the, and how the gift is going to help them and allow them to do. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It so really good. Does, it really does work. It just it just takes all that pressure off of you, and you say, oh, you know. And and then the other thing is when you prepare as best you can. Now there's always another moment or another practice session or another engagement to deliver that speech, and each time you would expect to get better, right, with practice. But if you practice as much as you can in good faith and then get a good night's sleep. And then you go into it the next day, say, no, I practiced as much as I could. I worked with Rosemary, I got it down. I'm just to do it. And then it's like, you're not, is anyone gonna be absolutely perfect? No, but that's not the point. The point is just charge through and do the best you can with the practice that you've had. And mm -hmm. not be worried about you know, if you if you forget something, go back to it. If you if you're doing something with slides and you advance to the wrong slide, so what? Just you know, just enjoy, be in the moment, and enjoy the experience. Wise advice there, wise advice there, because I think that and, and you said this, people feel it. They feel if you're if you're there with them, if you're. Um, 
passionate about what you do. And if that comes through because you practice and you really want to help them understand or get the gift, I think, or give it, receive the gift that, that you're trying to give them. I think it's good yeah. and it will, they'll feel it. They'll feel it. So you were talking about something. I don't want us to get off because we're getting closer to the end here. You were talking about something earlier before we got on and it was smart brevity. Mm -hmm. I would really like to hear just a, just a moment about that because I, I love the top, the subject. Yes, it uh, it was a um, a workshop, a virtual workshop I did this afternoon, that where I was for the, really for the first time actually sharing. Uh, well, I've I've written blogs about it, but it's something that came through Dory Clark, who I think you know, one of our the foremost mm -hmm. business thinkers of 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 our time, and she shared it in one of her seminars because this concept of of the brevity that comes from having a structure that consists of 27 words nine uh, delivered in nine seconds and containing three ideas is such a powerful and potent structure meaning that this apparently came from the vermont state legislature an obscure origin story, but it came from legislators who were tired of these verbose, long-winded speeches, and then created this 2793 formula to say, okay, so when you get to the microphone, we want to hear the the, bre the brief 2793, give us that at the very top, and then the rest is gravy. So if you look at that, the nine seconds, ten, nine to 10 seconds is pretty much of a soundbite. You know, it's what you might hear in the news, when you hear a clip of someone saying something. So it's what our brains process very efficiently. The three ideas goes back to the, the, to the beauty and the magic of the number three allows us to remember. And the 27 words are what you can say comfortably within those nine seconds. So if you are doing a, an elevator pitch or you're doing an opening to a speech or you're doing uh, just an introduction, let's say at a networking event, that that is a wonderful way to have that construct just to keep you on topic and uh, it's uh, it's it's brevity is is golden and most people err on the side of saying too much and that costs them costs them attention credibility authority you know people who talk too much could be perceived as not really knowing what they're talking about because they're just blabbering on but if you just give people enough that they can take away three great ideas, then your, 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 your job is done. Yeah. I think that's, and to be able to say that in nine seconds is powerful because you really need to understand what you're talking about to break whatever you're trying to communicate into basically nine words for each idea it's 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 mm -hmm. it's it's a challenge but if you can be that succinct and and do it it's got to be interesting to see how it works do you have do you have a, a one that you've done that you could share with us I, and we didn't talk about this first if you don't that's cool i was just oh, oh my goodness now you put i was like spot. put you right on the spot like that you know me i kind of fly around when we when we do these things but well, if you don't I'm going, no to give you, I'm going to give you one that i used in the in the workshop today very good I have my own, which is different for every um, for every situation. But if we look at, for example, we had in the state of Florida, obviously a climate catastrophe. And I, I actually wrote this example a couple of months ago. Oh, wow. Obviously, more very recently we had we were we're still coming out of a tragedy, a climate tragedy. But this is the way it goes. So this is this is about climate action. I'm starting with climate catastrophes are costly. They're twice as devastating for Florida's waterfront. New building codes can change the fate of the half a million residential properties built along the shoreline. So three ideas, climate catastrophes are costly. They're twice as devastating in the, in the waterfront, but new building codes can be a solution. Those are the three ideas. Wow. Yeah. So that if you is... start with a, with a strong affirmative statement, climate catastrophes are costly. And then you, you, you bring your sort of tear down to more specifics. You know, it's 
the, the, the affecting the waterfront and then affecting those half a million um, homes. And I know that we've had probably much more than that with um, the uh, the damage caused by uh, Hurricane Ian here in the, the Gulf Coast. Yes, yes, well, that's a great example. So it and and it is. It's a, it's about clarifying the words that we say so they they resonate with the the, the receivers, the people that are hearing and listening to them. Right, wow. and and yeah, and so you can you know, you can do this sort of in, in it's a good thing it's a good exercise to do when you're on a plane and you sort of want to jot down those 27 words and maybe have them for different situations and maybe use them on the person sitting next to you on the plane who someone you don't know and and put it into into practice and see how people react and it's a great icebreaker certainly to mm-hmm. start a conversation with someone you don't know, I mean, not, not with climate catastrophes, but something about you, something about what you do, what you love. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's just, it just gives us sometimes when we have templates, we are more likely to take action. Because if you say to somebody, hey, just be brief, just be brief and give me something in under 10 seconds. Well, where do you start? Right? But if you say the 27 words with with these three main ideas, then you have to be sure to have three distinct ideas in there. Otherwise, it's just 27 words, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great examples and places to use them. I'm running through my mind here. I'm writing some notes for myself. This is awesome. Well, Rosemary, it's been so wonderful to have you and just listen to you. As, as I spoke about earlier, I've got two pages of notes here, but I'm going back to them about the fact that, you know, the three three ideas and when you talked about know who you're speaking to, what do they need from you, what do they need to hear, make sure you're using words that are comfortable with you and think about the sentence structure, how long a sentence is you use and the words that you use to make sure whether you're using a conversational approach in a one-on-one or a, a presentation type setting, I just so much good in here. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, talk to you about this, what are, what's the best way is reaching out on LinkedIn, going to your website. What are, both, really both. I have several ways of contacting me on the website. My name is Rosemary Ravenel with a V Ravenel. like Victor. I have the honor to have a unique name. There's nobody on the planet to my knowledge. And maybe people out there will say, no, I know somebody whose name is Rosemary Ravenel. I'd love to meet that person because to my, as of this moment, in all my years on earth, I know of no one who has my name. Hence, there won't be any confusion when you go, when you, when you Google Rosemary Ravenel and you'll see rosemaryravenel.com. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter. I do a video newsletter. Then every other week I do a video, then I do a written blog and you'll find downloadable uh, material like an executive presence on how to do a video interview on how to be a podcast guest. As a matter of fact, I have a download wow. that has wonderful ideas as to, you know, how to prepare to be the best possible guest on a podcast and uh, yeah. how to do a presentation on zoom, how to improve your presence on zoom with something called the zoom score, which I trademarked as a 10 point checklist to make sure that you're showing up in this rectangle as your best on brand and on message. So there's a lot of good stuff there. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your questions and certainly to have an opportunity to be invited back on this program. Awesome stuff, Rosemary. And I think it's so cool because I've never heard someone else say they are the only person with that name in the world that they know of. And I think I'm that as well. So, all very right. Cool. Well, let's, let's, let's make a toast to that. I mean, if yeah. I find another Damon, this, this, this yeah. Tuka, I mean, I will, yeah. I will yeah. let you know. If very Pistuka, good. Pistulka, Pistulka, right? Pistulka. Mm-hmm. Yep, pistol. I will. Yep. I will flag it and say, "Hey." Yeah, you know gotta flag it. it and do it because <laughs> I've I've been looking all the way back into Europe and we we haven't found one, so it'll be interesting. But Rosemary, I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for sharing your your knowledge and 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 people that are listening today and and people will be listening on the podcast later. Reach out to Rosemary. 
she's got, like she said, on her website, LinkedIn, tons of great resources. Subscribe to her newsletter and reach out if you want that one-on-one -on -one coaching. Thanks so much for being here today, Rosemary. It's been a delight. Thank you, Damon. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We will be back again with another great episode in the near future.